It's good to see you. Hope that you're well. Hope that you've continued to know the Lord's blessing and goodness. We are still in Mark's Gospel. We're halfway through chapter 6. Uh, and as we've seen throughout this chapter, it is action filled uh, and it goes from one series of events to another. Today we're looking at one of Jesus' most famous miracles. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, That will take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus told them to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. I wonder how you respond when your plans are disrupted, or maybe you're interrupted while doing something important. Uh, or when you are planning to do something uh, and something else crops up. Do you get frustrated? Do you say things that you later regret? Maybe you get annoyed or angry, a little bit grumpy. Just consider how many times Jesus is interrupted in Mark's Gospel, just in the chapters that we've already read. So chapter 1, verse 21, if you went to Capernaum, And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching. And then a man who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out. As he is teaching, this man cries out and disturbs him. Chapter 1 again, verses 29 and 30. As they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Again, I guess you would have expected to go there for some food, to have a rest. And he has to help out uh, this needy and vulnerable uh, sick woman. Uh, In verses 35 uh, to 37 of chapter 1, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He went to a solitary place to pray. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they explained, everyone is looking for you. He can't escape. Verses 30 to 40, let us go somewhere else. So he travelled around preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. But as he did this, then a man with leprosy came to him and begged him. Into chapter 2, uh, we see that he is there teaching to a crowd. He has to go into a house. And as he's in the house, the crowds are all gathered and a man is lowered through the roof unexpectedly. Chapter 3. Uh, this is one and two. Another time Jesus went to the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Verse 20 of chapter 3. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And it continues like this. Uh, he is interrupted again and again. Uh, He starts to preach and someone gets up who needs help. 
or there are crowds in his way uh, that he cannot eat, he cannot pray, he cannot teach. Again and again he is interrupted. As he sets out to do one thing, he has to respond to the people who come before him and the situation changes very, very quickly. Now he is the son of God, he is the author of time and history of course, he is all-knowing but he is also fully man. He is full of uh, human traits, born of flesh and blood. He was tried and tested in every way and yet without sin. As he uh, was interrupted, as uh, the outward plans were disrupted, Again and again we see that he has to change his approach, change his methods, he has to respond to the people in front of him. And on each occasion he is interrupted, he responds with patience, grace and compassion. For Jesus, people came uh, before plans. Individuals had primacy over a crowd. Ministry was more important than methods. There are times when he was righteously angered and grieved by disbelieving interrogators, but he always responded to them. He always responded to those interruptions. He never shrugged off people or dismissed them. He always had time for people. And what an example that is for us, isn't it? Proverbs 19 verse 9 is so helpful. Um, a man's heart plans his course, but the Lord determines it. There are times when we try to fix our course, we try to fix and determine our plans and thinking that we're the ones who are in control. And we often get frustrated and irritated in life because, well, we think that those plans are set in stone. And so when anything comes to disrupt that, we, we get irritable. Let us live our lives with open hands, with open hearts, with open plans, trusting in God in all things, that even the interruptions and the disruptions, the unexpected calls, those hold-ups, are all in God's perfect plan. Remembering that all things happen uh, for, for good, and that in these delays, in these interruptions, there might be an opportunity to grow in our faith, a chance to bless or to help others, Maybe God is even protecting us in those delays. In today's passage, we see three apparent interruptions uh, or an enforced change. Um, so in verse 30, uh, we see uh, that they cannot eat uh, because of all the people who are there surrounding them. Uh, and then he goes uh, to have a, to a solitary place to rest. And they cannot rest there because uh, the crowd has followed them, uh, and then there, having seen the crowd, then he sees they in need, uh, that they need to be taught, and they need then to be fed. So Jesus' plans, the outward plans that he has shared with the others, well, it needs to adapt, it needs to change, it is affected by the circumstances. I think we would have grumbled, we would have complained. But Jesus is very different. What do we see then? Well, the first thing we notice is the character of Jesus, that he is the compassionate one. Ironically, of course, this story begins with Jesus and his disciples not able to eat because of the crowd. It's important to notice that, that the very thing that launches this whole scenario is that the disciples are not able to finish off their food because the crowds are coming. If it had happened today, people have been asking for selfies and for autographs. They are there approaching Jesus. And so he takes them away to a solitary place in verse 32. We're told in Luke's Gospel that it is towards Bethsaida and the northeastern shore of Galilee. So presumably he crosses from Capernaum and they go right along the shore edge uh, and they settle just by Bethsaida. Uh, but when they get there, there are crowds. They've all gone ahead. And they are there meeting Jesus and the disciples as they arrive. In his pillar commentary on Mark, James Edwards makes an interesting point. 
uh, that this part of Galilee uh, was uh, a nationalistic uh, stronghold, uh, that it was notorious for uh, the, the zeal of the, the local population. It was the heartland of the, the zealots. Acts 5 refers to Judas the Galilean, uh, who led a rebellion against the Roman ruler. So he was from uh, this area. In John's account, we're told that Jesus knew that the crowd who had gathered there were hoping to make him king by force. So it's likely that this crowd had met, had come together, not because they wanted to see miracles or because they wanted people healed or demons cast out. It seems likely that this crowd in this part of Galilee had a nationalistic fervour. Uh, the desire for the Messiah to be anointed and to be appointed the king. And presumably they would have appointed him to be the leader of a coup. And so there is this fervour here. And remember, Jesus sees them as sheep without a shepherd. Now, shepherd in the Old Testament has many different connotations. It also includes a military leader. So it seems that what we have here is a group of people waiting for a military leader. They have an idea of a Messiah who will come and who will lead a coup against the Roman uh, leadership. And Jesus sees them. He sees this crowd and he is full of compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He feels pity. He feels sympathy. He feels their pain, he feels their sorrow, that they are shepherds, a sheep without a shepherd. They are lost. I think that's the best way to describe the crowd here. They don't have a leader. They don't have a vision. It is likely that they are militant, potentially violent. They haven't got a spiritual compass or a spiritual outlook on life. They are focusing on the enslavement, uh, the political enslavement uh, that they're having to endure at the hands of the Romans. No awareness of their spiritual captivity. Fundamentally, they do not know God. And so they haven't got a shepherd. They haven't got a religious leader. They haven't got a teacher. They haven't got a guide. They haven't got spiritual discernment. And so as Jesus sees this crowd, he is filled with compassion. And this word is used exclusively for Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus alone is described as the compassionate one uh, because it is a divine attribute that requires the work of God in someone's heart. So he feels this compassion. A sinner looking on this crowd might have been angered by them. We want to rest. We want to eat. I want to be able to teach. Or he might have been swayed. A sinner might have been swayed by the crowd. Wanting to please the crowd. Wanting to play up to the crowd. He might have been intimidated by it. But when Jesus sees the crowd, he sees their heart. He sees their spiritual condition. He sees their need. And he's moved to pity. Again, Setting an example for us and also an encouragement. I remember a pastor telling me when I first did school assemblies, the prospect of two to three hundred, fifteen or sixteen year olds in front of me, and perhaps aware of how daunting that might be, uh, or the danger of portraying them, perceiving them in a negative fashion. And he told me just to remember that they are sheep without a shepherd not to play up to the crowd, not to be intimidated, but to remember that ultimately people made in the image of God, sheep without a shepherd. Brother Andrew, uh, who was most known for his work uh, in the Soviet Union before uh, the fall of communism, but in his later years uh, he was able to go to the Middle East and he had access to a couple of terrorist training camps in Afghanistan uh, and he told people that the important thing was to remember that these are not monsters essentially he was saying that 
you saw them as sheep without a shepherd. When you think of our country, when you see people on TV or in the media, it is so easy to become critical or self-righteous. When we see people giving a hard time to fellow Christians, persecuting them, marginalising them, being cruel, it is easy to feel a sense of bitterness or even hatred bubbling up within us. But when Jesus saw this crowd, there is no bitterness, there is no anger, there is no frustration, there is compassion. And this is a divine attribute. So if we are to live like this ourselves, we need the Spirit of God to help us, to equip us in all of this. And he is filled then with compassion. And what does he do? Well, he begins to teach. We are very familiar with this event, of course, and sometimes in our mind we think that he is compassionate and so the answer is to feed them. But actually, before he feeds them, he feeds them the word of God. It's important to remember that, that the most compassionate thing we could ever do to anyone, the greatest gift we could give someone, is the word of God. This is what Jesus understands here, that as he sees this crowd without a leader, without a spiritual vision, a spiritual outlook on life, he opens the word of God and he himself teaches as the son of God. And this is our greatest need. I hope you realise that we are also sheep without a shepherd by nature, that we all need to hear these words we are lost sheep as we are we need to hear the words of the lord jesus we need to hear the words of the true shepherd these are the words that will set us free it's the word of jesus that will give us forgiveness peace and joy it's the word of jesus that will give us true spiritual understanding and an eternal knowledge of god it's the word of god that will give us clarity as we live our lives today and discernment to know what is right and what is wrong. It is the word of God that will make us wise in this world. And so Jesus is full of compassion. So we see here his character, that here is the compassionate one. Here is one who doesn't get frustrated, doesn't get grumpy or angry, not bitter. But here is one who feels for people and he has time for people. And he knows that their greatest need is the word of God. Yes, he will help them practically and he never neglects people physically. We are to pray for our daily bread. We are to help people physically and we'll see, of course, that Jesus does this. But the primary need is spiritual. The second thing to see here is the identity of Jesus. We've seen his character as the compassionate one. Well, we also see his identity very clearly in this event. So having taught them, having nourished them by the word of God, he knows that he needs to provide for them physically as well. It's the apostles, of course, who raise the problem uh, and they have a sensible enough solution. This is 35 and 36. They're aware that it's getting late and it's a large crowd. Uh, and so their answer is to disperse the crowd, to send them to the towns and the villages while it is still early enough so they can buy food for themselves. Well, this is a, a perfectly sensible solution. Uh, it is what people do today. You don't have uh, large crowds gathering too long. You disperse them so they can go and have food and drink. Jesus' answer seems less sensible. In verse 37, he tells them that they need to provide food for them. You give them something to eat, he says in verse uh, 37. But they respond, again, sensibly enough, but showing their lack of spiritual insight, or again, showing how the Lord surprises us continually. And that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread? And give it to them to eat. That doesn't seem to be sensible for us to, to give all of that money to, to feed all of these people. And Jesus, of course, has a far greater uh, and more remarkable plan. And so he tells them, well, how many loaves do you have? 
Jesus is far more interested in what they have, by the way, than what they do not have. It's important to remember that. What? How many loaves do we have? Well, when they found out, they said five and two fish. Then he told them to go and to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down. And so he takes the five loaves and the two fish and he looks up to heaven. He gives thanks, he breaks the loaves and he gives them to his disciples. They vise the two fish similarly and they all ate and they were all satisfied. We see here the identity of the Lord Jesus very, very clearly. There are some obvious things that we see that he is the son of God who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. He is above nature. He transcends natural laws. He's the creator uh, who can bring something out of nothing, really. He can subvert the normal natural order and perform amazing miracles. He is the son of God. He is the creator, the heir of all things. He is the servant of the Lord who's come in the power of the Holy Spirit to help the weak and the vulnerable to perform miracles, to help the, and to bless the most needy in society. These miracles, as Peter would say in the day of Pentecost, uh, attest to his being, to him being from God, that he is God's servant. We see also, of course, that he is the shepherd, and that he is the embodiment. He is really the Lord who is in Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And what does he do here? Well, he lays the people down, makes them sit on the green grass. And he provides for them wonderfully so that they shall not want. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. In verse 44, we told that the number of the men who had eaten was 5,000, plus the wives, plus the children. And yet, verse 43 tells us that the disciples picked up uh, the, the basket, 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The cup overflows. The baskets are overflowing with, with bread and fish. This is such an important principle. Uh, my friend Terry Dowsett, uh, who's a director of um, BCNE, uh, which is a Baptist College of New England, uh, has also been studying this passage this week, it seems, uh, and he shared online this. Everyone ate until they were satisfied. They ended up with more than they started with. And this is what Jesus does. When we give him whatever time, talent or treasure we have, he blesses it and multiplies it. And we end with more than we started with. Terry is a man who has suffered and his wife has gone through years of chemotherapy, uh, cancer treatment. And yet he can testify to the truth here that the Lord gives a multitude, that our cup overflows when we know him. Give your life to Jesus, submit to him, honour him, and you will see that he will multiply the blessings. He will not be shortchanged. There are times when you will be very aware of your cup overflowing with God's grace and mercy. And so we see here that he's the shepherd who feeds the shepherd who provides, the shepherd who blesses us far more than we could ever begin to imagine. The baskets are closed and full to brimming. He is the shepherd who provides all things. And in heaven, of course, we'll certainly know that cup overflowing. But there are more subtle things here that we're told about Jesus as well. He is the new Moses. Now, in verse 40, he places them to sit in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, there's a practical reason for this, but there's an echo here of another shepherd leader, another deliverer, Moses. In Exodus 18, verse 25, we're told that Moses listened to his father-in-law. He chose capable men, made them leaders and officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. And that in that a wilderness experience they are placed in groups and that moses is instructed by the lord 
through Jethro, actually, his father-in-law, to organise them well. He categorises them into groups. He leads them into a quiet place. He leads them to a solitary place where the Lord provides food from heaven for them. And so there's a clear echo here of the way Moses led his people. The difference being, of course, and that Moses was a recipient himself, and that he had to receive the bread, the manna from heaven, whereas Jesus is the creator, he is the son of God. He is the new Moses, but he's greater than Moses because he's the one who provides the bread himself. So Jesus then, well, we see that he's a greater deliverer, he's a greater Moses, he's a greater provider. He's the one who takes people to a solitary place and he gives them more than they can imagine. And Moses led people to the promised land and Jesus will lead people to an, an even greater promised land, to heaven itself, a new heaven and a new earth. So we see here that he is the one who uh, is the, the son of God. He's a servant of the Lord. He is the shepherd who provides. He's a new Moses who will provide food from heaven, who will lead and guide people to deliverance, to the promised land. And there is something else here as well. Verse 41, we're told that he gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and they distributed it. Does that remind you of something? The Lord Jesus gave thanks, broke the bread, distributed amongst the disciples. Surely there's an echo here of what had happened in a matter of months in the upper room when the Lord would establish the Lord's Supper and that Passover meal where Jesus would give thanks, where he would break the bread and he would say, this is my body broken for you. Surely as we see this bread being provided, we are compelled to remember that Jesus is the bread of life, that he has come down and that his body would be broken for our sins. So in this most remarkable of miracles, we are reminded of bread being provided from heaven. We are reminded of Jesus and we are reminded that that body was broken for us. And so we remember that Jesus is the crucified one. We remember that he is the shepherd, he is the son of God, he is the servant who would bless us by dying in our place. Do you know the saviour? Do you know him? Do you praise and worship the saviour day after day? And then we come to the final point, which is the sovereignty of Jesus. The story begins with Jesus taking the apostles to a quiet place where they can rest and where they can perhaps meditate and consider about the things that have happened to reflect on what the Lord has been doing. And that is interrupted. Uh, and so there's a sense in which the opportunity to reflect, the opportunity to learn has gone. But here's the thing. We see that Jesus' plans are always perfect and God's plans are always good. The apparent plan the plan which had been revealed, well, that seems to have been uh, thwarted. That God and Jesus' plans are never undermined. There is a greater plan. Uh, and as this crowd comes, well, we see here so many lessons. We see the importance of compassion. And this is what the disciples would have been taught. They saw here the compassionate character of the uh, leader the importance of compassion was shown the primacy of teaching was revealed also the need to help people physically to care for their physical needs was shown the nature and the heart of true faith was seen that we should focus on the little that we have and how the lord can use that not focus on what we do not have and then become disillusioned the grace of God that he wants to use us. Notice that he uses the apostles in all of this. And the Lord wants to use us. He wants to use you in the work of blessing others. You have a role to play. If you're not a Christian, the Lord wants to call you. The Lord wants to use you. If you are a Christian, he wants to use you to bless others. 
And then, of course, the identity of Jesus is revealed. We see him as the compassionate one, the son of God who has power, the shepherd who provides, the new Moses who will provide manna from heaven and who will deliver people into the promised land, the crucified one. Give thanks for the interruptions in life. Give thanks for those delays. If nothing had happened, then none of this would have taken place. If Jesus had been angry, if he'd been annoyed, if he'd been grumpy and just ignored the group. But because of his wonderful character, this whole wonderful episode unfolds and we learn so much about God. So I wonder what you need to remember today. To focus on the identity of Jesus to know him, to trust him for the first time, to know that when you trust in him, you will never be shortchanged, but that your cup will overflow. The basket will always be full in the Lord Jesus. Or maybe you need to learn by the grace of God and by the power of the Spirit to follow his example, to be compassionate and to bless others. Well, I trust and pray that the Lord has spoken to all of us and that we would be amazed at such a wonderful, remarkable person, the Lord Jesus. Trust in him and obey and follow him in all things.